Welcome back. Continuing our t discussion of hair, I want to talk about types and growth of hair. Lanugo is a, a type of hair that fetuses have. It's a fine uh, hair over the surface of the fetus's body, and uh, before the fetus is born, sometimes it falls off, or shortly thereafter coming out. Vellus hair is short, pale, fine uh, body hair um, that's all over the surface of our skin. Uh, some people would describe it as being like a peach fuzz uh, type of effect. And then we also have terminal hair, which are coarse, long hairs um, that you would find in your scalp and in your um, eyebrows, eyelashes, and such as that. Uh, at puberty, these, uh, these terminal hairs will appear in the axillary and pubic regions of both sexes uh, and the face and necks of male males, therefore they have to begin to shave. There's a lot of factors that affect the, uh, the growth of your hair, uh, you know, anywhere from nutrition, hormones, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, age, genetics, gender, stress, uh, hormones that you're taking, uh, medications that you're taking, so a wide variety of things will affect your uh, the growth of your hair. Um, we do have follicle cycles, hair follicle cycles, and they will go in uh, between um, active and regressive phases. Um, your average hair growth per week is about 2.25 uh, millimeters. So not a huge amount, but enough to where you have to get a haircut every once in a while. And we lose between 70 and 100 scalp hairs uh, every day. We're shedding skin and, and hairs all the time. So um, don't commit a crime. You're leaving lots of evidence behind everywhere you go. Hair color is due to the amount of uh, melanin that pr that's present in your hair follicles. Dark colored hair is going to have a lot of that eumelanin. That's the brown to black uh, colored melanin. Uh, and blonde and red hair is going to have more of the pheomelanin, which is uh, yellow to reddish in coloration. If you have gray hair, there's low amounts of melanin that are present. So the less and less melanin you have, the more gray it becomes. Eventually, white hair has a complete lack of melanin and actually has air bubbles in the hair shaft. And this causes that uh, coloration of white. Of course, hair can be bleached. It can be colored in all different kinds of ways. Um, and uh, so that's a possibility as well for different hair color. So you can see the uh, hair follicles are part of the epidermis, but they extend down into the dermis. And then there's uh, parts that are associated with it. The erector pili muscles, again, are those muscles that are attached to it. And we do have sebaceous glands that will be uh, um, intimately connected to the hair follicle to lubricate it with uh, oily secretions. So since we were talking about sebaceous glands, let's go ahead and we'll wrap those up. They're very widely distributed across the surface of your skin. Um, they're not in thick skin of the palms and soles. Of course, you wouldn't want to make uh, any kind of a lipid on your fingers or soles because it would be slippery. Most, develop, uh, most of these sebaceous glands develop from your hair follicles and secrete the oily secretion onto the hair follicles. Um, these uh, sebaceous glands are relatively inactive uh, until puberty, and then they're stimulated by hormones, especially the uh, androgens, the male hormones, in order to start uh, producing oils. Um, the sebaceous glands do secrete an oil called sebum. It's a holocrine secretion. It's an oily holocrine secretion. And uh, so um, if you remember back to the different kinds of, uh, of glands, you have holocrine, merocrine, and apocrine glands. And holocrine secrete whole cells that makes up the secretion. The sebum is uh, bactericidal, and uh, to some uh, bacteria it uh, will kill them, but others it won't. Uh, it softens the hair and skin and reduces water loss from the skin. And if you have acne, at least some forms of acne, you could have blocked sebaceous glands that swell, and taking an antibiotic can actually cure you of that acne. Other kinds of acne are not uh, necessarily due to um, uh, sebaceous glands that are infected with um, with bacteria. Some acne is from in, just inflammation, and that could be uh, a hormonal um, horm hormones uh, out of balance can actually uh, cause an inflammation of the acne in addition to um, the bacterial infection. So sweat glands are also called sudoriferous glands. Uh, all skin glands, except uh, they're found on all skin except for the nipples and parts of the external genitalia. Uh, we have about 3 million sweat glands per person, and uh, the sweat glands can come in one of two kinds, eccrine 
or merocrine sweat glands and apocrine sweat glands. Um, these glands contain an interesting um, type of cell. It's called a myoepithelial cell. Myo refers to it as like a muscle-like action. Epithelial means it's an epithelial cell. Um, but it does have the ability to contract and squeeze fluids. So that's kind of an interesting um, thing that it contains. Um, so under nervous stimulation, you can force sweat into the ducts um, because of those myoepithelial cells. Uh, eccrine sweat glands are the most numerous of the sweat glands, and uh, they're uh, abundant, especially on your palm soles and forehead. Palms and soles for adding grip, uh, and uh, uh, probably forehead for releasing um, heat through evaporative cooling. Uh, when the sweat goes on your head and, the, and the, it evaporates away, it carries heat with it. Um, so the eccrine sweat glands have ducts that connect to pores to the skin surface, and uh, thermoregulation is one of the main jobs of these sweat glands. Sweat glands are regulated by the sympathetic nervous system that are under your voluntary control, but uh, typically they're under nervous control, especially your fright or flight system is going to have uh, the greatest uh, impact on these sweat glands. Of course, they do uh, secrete sweat, that's evident. And sweat is 99% water, but there are also salts, urea, ammonia, which are, um, which are uh, breakdown products from breaking down things like amino acids and proteins and DNA. There's other kinds of ions in it, uh, lactic acids, some, some acids, some vitamins, and different things that are in it. And this is just showing you a sebaceous gland down here. And, uh, and then it's showing you an eccrine sweat gland over, over uh, here. Uh, notice that the little tube snakes, snakes up and is released on the surface of the skin. You can see various pores here, here, and here. But the sebaceous gland lubricates the hair follicles, so the oils come up by the hair follicles. Uh, apocrine sweat glands are confined to your axillary, that is underneath your armpit, your anogenital areas and pigmented areas of the breast. So around the genitals and anus, you'll see these apocrine sweat glands. They do produce a, uh, a sweaty, fatty, proteinaceous kind of uh, secretion. It's viscous and milky or even yellowish. Um, it is odorless. Uh, that is until bacteria begin to interact with it. And when they interact with it, they break down those products and create uh, very specific body odors. Um, if you take and put uh, uh, deodorant on, you know, sometimes deodorants will work by blocking the pores so that the, uh, the secretions can't be released. Uh, perhaps you could research other ways that, uh, that uh, uh, and, and, uh, pers perspirants um, work. Um, these apocrine sweat glands lie deeper in the dermis uh, and even into the subcutaneous layer and then empty um, onto, um, into the hair follicles or the surface of the hair follicles. Beginning at uh, puberties when they begin to work, um, their function in, human, in humans is really relatively unknown, but we do think they might be some kind of a sexual scent gland, um, but you know the evidence is still out. But definitely in other animals it works that way. These are... Uh, so there are uh, modified apocrine sweat glands. One of them is a ceruminous gland. These line the external ear canal, that, that hole that goes, it brings uh, sound into your, um, into your ear so it can strike the eardrum. And uh, these ceruminous glands will secrete earwax. Mammary glands will uh, secrete the milk. And this is just showing you again a sweat gland here with the pores on the surface that you can see here, here, and here. Okay, so let's talk about another accessory organ, the nails. Nails, fingernails grow about uh, one millimeter per week. Um, they are scale-like modifications of the epidermis. They are uh, a protective cover over the distal uh, parts of your fingertips and the dorsal or back surfaces of your fingers and toes. And they contain a really super hard keratin. And in other animals, they create nails. So they create like sharp, um, sharp uh, actual claws. Uh, and us, of course, they're fingernails, but they do short for claws and, uh, and other animals. Sometimes they'll even be hooked and pointed so they can grab a hold of and tear uh, prey items. So your actual nail has several parts to it. It has a free edge 
It's the part that you trim with the nail clipper. It has the nail plate or the nail body, uh, which is the part you can see over the surface. And then it has a root to it, a proximal root as it's anchored into the um, epidermis. The nail matrix is the part at the very, very uh, most proximal end where the cells will grow in number and then create the, uh, the, the actual fingernail. That's where nail growth occurs. So I don't know if you ever thought about the fingernails being so complex, but they, they do have a lot of parts to it. So here is your free edge, the nail body, okay, uh, and then the, um, the nail uh, root will be over here. So here's the root of the nail, then you have the body of it, and then you have the free edge. So that's the parts of your nail. Um, down here you have the nail matrix. The nail matrix is the part that has the cells that will grow and produce the new nail um, that's forming. You do, you do also have um, a lunula. The lunula is that kind of that whitish part uh, at the proximal part of your nail. And... Uh, and it's kind of uh, kind of whitish in coloration. It kind of masks or hides the the, the blood vessels underneath. Um, it's kind of a thickened area. The epinicium is the cuticle, and it's made of stratified uh, cor the stratified cornum. So it's a dead layer of cells out there that accumulates and kind of is a protective uh, fold of um, epidermis. Uh, we also have the nail bed. This is below the nail plate and it anchors the nail. Um, bed to the uh, finger. So if you've ever tried to rip your nail up this way, you know that it's anchored by that nail bed. The uh, hyponychium is the, it secures the nail to the fingertip, so it's an anchor point uh, for that. Okay, so I think that's the parts of the nail. Now, you know, if you ever get to be a professional person that actually observes people, um, the fingernails tell you a lot about a human being. Um, I did put a, a website there. You're welcome to go to that website and learn more about fingernails and what they tell you about people. But fingernails can be all different kinds of colors. They can have all different kinds of shapes. Um, they can have lines in them, pitted. Uh, they can have shapes like spoon bills um, or like spoons. So this one right here shows uh, cyanosis. So that's basically poor circulation. Over here we have jaundice. So you can see what it looks like when you have something like hepatitis. And then these down here are uh, melanomas or cancers that have moved through uh, and underneath the uh, fingernail. Um, so if you ever looked at a, uh, uh, at a, um, a frontal view of a, um, a fingernail and it's, it's like, uh, it looks like a spoon, that can represent iron deficiency anemia. If you have stripes in there, that can represent uh, cancer. Um, so there's a whole wide variety of things you can tell about a person's fingernails, um, you know, health-wise. Um, our skin does have sensory receptors all over the surface of it, and there is a special place in the brain. So this little section of the brain right here is called the somatosensory cortex. And this is the part of the brain on both sides. It just happens to be one side over here. Um, but this is the part of the brain that actually senses the feeling uh, that you have of your skin. And there's a map of it that, that uh, people have made. You can actually take and cut the, uh, the cranium off and stimulate with electrodes different parts of the brain and make a map of where each sensation is felt within the, br within the brain. Um, this happens to be a frontal view. So if I take the, this brain and I cut it in a frontal view, a frontal view goes through this way, and then look at the brain um, from this view that the uh, arrow is pointing to, um, I can see the brain this way. Okay, so this is a this is a uh, a frontal or, or coronal section of the brain, and you can actually map. So there's a place where your genitals are felt on your brain and your toes and your foot. And with electrical stimulation, um, people can describe feeling their foot being touched, but uh, they're not really being touched. It's just the cells on the brain being stimulated. So our whole brain is mapped. Um, using this electrical stimulation. And you can see that a large portion of our brain is dedicated to the face, a large por portion is dedicated to the hand, a large portion is dedicated to our feet. These are places that are very sensitive to us. But very little, you know, uh, sensation, um, a very little part of the brain is dedicated to feeling our forearm or, or perhaps our uh, bicep, okay? And uh, people have made models of this. If you were to make a scale model of a person based on how much of their brain is dedicated to feeling different body parts, this is what the person would actually look like. 
And what this uh, somatic sensory man uh, um, basically indicates is that a huge part of our brain is dedicated to feeling our hands. And that's why on this model, the hands are overrepresented, just indicating that the brain really overrepresents that. A huge part of our brain is dedicated to feeling um, our face, especially our lips and tongue. A huge part of our brain is dedicated to feeling our feet, but very little part of the brain is dedicated to feeling the backs of the arms or our backs or our neck. Um, these places just aren't that sensitive, but our ear actually is relatively sensitive. So smell sensory man is just kind of interesting to show that if you made a map or a human model based on how much of the brain is dedicated to different body parts, this is what it would look like. Okay, well, you know, there's all kinds of skin problems. Most of the skin problems that we have are some variation of uh, dermatitis or inflammation or swelling of the skin. Of course, there's hay fever, hives, drug, food allergies, eczema, uh, measles and pox or viral infections that cause a dermatitis to occur. There's a whole host of various bacterial infections, staphylococcus. Uh, you have leprosy, which is a bacterial disease. All different kinds of venereal or sexually transmitted infections that affect the skin, fungal infections, mites, which are sometimes colloquially known as uh, scabies. Um, these things are all uh, problems of the skin causing uh, various kinds of dermatitis. Um, if you go online, I'll put a little video there of how poison ivy works so that you can take a look at that. Um, I like chiggers. Chiggers are kind of cool uh, because uh, the adults will actually uh, lay eggs on the skin of, um, of individuals and, uh, and or they'll lay eggs and little larvae will uh, hatch out of those eggs. Those larvae can actually get into your skin, burrow down into the skin and spit. They have a, a stylus stone which is a little proboscis or mouth part that goes down into your skin and, and liquefies the skin and then serps up the tissues and feeds on the tissues. Um, chiggers don't really live inside of you. Uh, they do live inside of other uh, other animals, but they don't live inside of us. Um, but when they bite you, um, the the saliva, when it gets down into your skin, will actually cause your immune system to begin to fight it, and your immune system will cause swelling and irritation and redness, and those little bumps that are that are associated with um, with the uh, having chiggers. So these aren't chiggers living under skin; they're just a they're they're the immune reaction to the chiggers. So if you take a some kind of a cortisol or a steroid, um, they'll actually inhibit that. Maybe even a Benadryl might aid in helping to slow it down. But there's that stylostome, that mouth part that spits saliva down there that liquefies the tissues so it can have a little snack. Mosquitoes are really uh, important uh, vectors of the spread of disease in humans. Um, they do have a small mouth part, uh, a small as in thin mouth part, they can inject uh, saliva into you. Um, mosquitoes are venomous animals. They inject a, a venom into you that, uh, that numbs your skin. It also is an anticoagulant, and it makes your skin um, um, swell. It makes it bleed more easily, and uh, so uh, it doesn't allow scabs to form. When a mosquito bites into you, it does spit saliva into you, and that causes a wheal to occur, which is a, a, basically a swollen lump to occur. Um, you know, and that usually goes away, but any kind of bacteria that spit into you is now inside your body cruising around. Uh, if there's viruses and spits into you, then those are cruising around inside of you as well. Skin scan cancer is pretty uh, important to talk about for a minute. Um, there are three main types of skin cancer that you may come in contact with. Uh, squamous cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma, these are the kind of like better ones to get. And then malignant melanoma is the one that uh, is, uh, is very dangerous. So that's like a, scrawl, a skull and crow's bones. That's the best I could do. Um, you can see what basal cell carcinoma looks like, squamous cell carcinoma, and then you can see what melanoma looks like in the three pictures uh, below. Melanoma being the more serious one uh, means that I'll spend just another extra minute with it. Um, there are these things called the ABCDEs of melanoma. Each one of these letters represents some kind of a trait that melanoma can have that you need to observe when you look at moles or other uh, patches of, of pigment on your skin. A represents asymmetry. So if you were to take a look at, uh, at a mole, a mole is typically relatively symmetrical. Um, you can cut it in half, it's equal halves. But, uh, but a melanoma typically is asymmetrical. It is, that is, you can't cut it in half. 
The border in a regular mole is typically even and smooth, whereas in a uh, melanoma it's typically jagged or scalloped or uneven or notched. Um, the color of a melanoma is typically shaded all different kinds of colors. It can be brown, tan, black, blue, white, uh, or red, but typically a, a non-malignant um, mole is going to be one solid color. The diameter of a melanoma is typically bigger than a pencil eraser um, or larger. So uh, a malignant melanoma will be larger than a pencil eraser, but typically moles are smaller than or uh, the size of a pencil eraser in diameter. And uh, E represents evolving. So any change in a pigmented patch on your body, if it's moving, if it's changing in size, growing in color, shape, um, those are things that are warning signs for you to go get those checked out. Um, so if you have something on your body that looks like this, it should definitely be checked out uh, because the earlier you catch it, the better uh, your prognosis will be. So this is just a normal mole over here, and this would be what uh, kind of a melanoma would look like. So frostbite is also part of the uh, a, 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 a something associated with skin, a disease of the skin, or a uh, uh, something a trauma of the skin. In first degree uh, frostbite, you basically will damage the um, the first layer of skin, so your epidermis and your dermis will be uh, slightly irritated. Second degree, you're going to get major blistering, uh, and then third degree uh, frostbite, you're going to. Um, my apologies. Let me go back and do this again. So um, um, so frostbite is definitely where you get uh, uh, damage to the skin, and depending upon how how many layers it goes through, uh, you you may have to get that removed. If it's very little frostbite, you may be able to recover. If it's really bad frostbite, then you're going to have to basically get your toes uh, amputated. And let me let me go back and talk about burns. These would be burns down here. I probably shouldn't include this all in one diagram. My apologies on any confusion I have given you. Uh, in a first degree burn, you basically are going to burn the uh, epidermis, and you probably all had sunburns before and saw a layer of skin peel off. Second degree burns, you're going to burn down into the dermis, and you're going to have blistering effects, but perhaps no physical long-term damage. Third degree burns, you're going to have permanent damage to the tissue. It goes all the way down to the, uh, to the, uh, the uh, superficial fascia and uh, that can be really problematic. Burns can be very serious. If you burn a lot of the area of your body, infection is typically the way that you um, succumb to that particular disease. Um, the rule of nines is used to estimate the surface of your body. So uh, typically we say that 9% uh, of, uh, of the anterior and posterior head and neck, that makes up about 9% of your body. 4.5% for the front, 4.5% for the back. So your arms uh, shoulders and forearms and hands typically make up uh, about 9% when you add both of um, them together. Um, so, uh, you know, 36% of your body, which of course is a multiple of 9, um, is going to be made up of the anterior and posterior trunk. So, you know, each leg is uh, accounts for about 18% uh, about or 9% each. Um, so, um, if you use the rule of nines, if you go into an EMT, you can actually estimate uh, how much part of the body is burned. That gives you a prognosis of how, you know, the outcome or survival of the person. This is a bed sore, um, decubitis, uh, ulcers, and uh, you can see it's uh, basically a wound that you uh, can uh, develop on, side, on your skin. These things are also known as pressure ulcers. So anytime you put pressure on the skin, it pushes blood away from it from feeding the tissues. So if you work in a nursing home and your patients have these, that means you're going to go to jail or you're going to lose your job. Um, we do have to roll patients continuously so they don't have pressure put on, um, um, don't put pressure from their bones pr pressing on their skin and causing damage of the tissue. So if you have a tattoo, that's where you take ink and inject it into the dermis. If you injected ink into the epidermis, it would be sloughed off. But because it's injected down into the dermis, you, um, you can retain the inks over periods of time. They do move and they fade, but uh, they are retained down in there. Some people just out of curiosity actually have extra nipples. So you can actually have extra nipples in addition to the regular nipple. 
So just speaking uh, a couple last topics, so uh, a little bit about wound healing. Um, you can have uh, an epidermal wound. That's a wound that's in the epidermis. So when you damage the skin, the cells will actually migrate from the basal layers on either side, and eventually they'll fill in the spot that's actually uh, been damaged. Uh, if the wound is deeper, you have, um, you have um, uh, a, a deeper wound. It's called a deep wound healing, and uh, that occurs when the injury extends uh, to the dermis and subcutaneous layer. So notice the injury has occurred way down deep. That's going to be a whole different kind of thing to have to heal. Of course, the, the stratum uh, bosley has to heal itself across. You can see it heals itself across there. Then all this damage to the connective tissue, all the leaking blood has to be reabsorbed and, re, uh, and, and eaten up. And we have scar tissue that will actually fill in, the place, in place down here. Blood vessels that have opened up have to be resealed so that the, uh, they can reestablish the circulation through. So, um, so there's a lot more involved in that deep wound healing. Sometimes people develop these things called keloids where the scar tissue actually expands to the surface. And, uh, and those are called keloids that some folks get. So never take a system out of, um, uh, out, out from other, from looking at it uh, and how it's related to other systems. So, so every system's related to every other system and skin is no different. So this little graphic right here shows you that the skin is very useful to the skeletal system because it absorbs um, vitamin D. Um, it, it actually makes vitamin D, which helps us to absorb calcium, which makes bone strong. Uh, we need calcium that, uh, that the skin helps to make uh, or helps to absorb because it makes vitamin D. We need that for strong muscles. Also, the nerves will, uh, will use calcium um, in um, in helping it to process, uh, it also has lots of skin skin receptors that help us to process information. So again, endocrine system, vitamin D is a is a hormone, so it's part of that system. Uh, we also have um, it's part of the cardiovascular system because the blood vessels in the in the skin can dilate or can uh, or constrict, uh, thus allowing more circulation or less circulation. Our first line of defense against organisms happens at the skin. So, you know, we do have skin associated structures that filter air before they go into the uh, lungs. Uh, skin will help to, uh, to make vitamin D, which will help to um, uh, help us to absorb calcium in the digestive tract. So um, the urinary system uh, will actually take and, uh, and uh, um, it aids in helping to convert um, uh, the uh, coli, coli, coli uh, calciferol into uh, functional vitamin D, calcitriol. Okay, so that's the job of the kidney, which is part of the urinary system. And then, of course, there's a lot of reproductive parts that are associated with, um, with the skin. Our external genitalia are associated with skin. So in a whole, you know, this, the integrity system by itself is nothing, but it's part of a whole, and it contributes to all the different systems doing different jobs for it. Okay, well that completes the uh, integumentary system. I hope you've learned a few things. Um, it's a great system. It's a really uh, complicated and interesting system. And uh, so uh, next time we'll be diving into the uh, very cool system, the skeletal system. So until then, I will see you later.